I think it is important for us to look at what is happening to the minorities of Gujarat, very especially in the last 10 or 11 years. Now we have to look at the reality in three very distinct areas, but distinct not as much as it is, they are isolated, but they, in a way they are interrelated. The first is the Gujarat carnage of 2002 when we have more than 2,000 Muslims that were killed, uh, brutally brutalized, raped, left homeless, they were made to stay outside and so on. And still today, more than 10 years, 11 years down the road, we have not had justice for the victim survivors. Some cases have been well been on board, there have been convictions and so on, but the key players, nothing has happened to them. Some of the other, this has been mainstreamed. And what Amritya Sen has said just yesterday in a very, very powerful interview is that the fact that justice is not shown, there is no compassion for the minorities, speaks volumes for itself. I think that is the first factor. Related to it, what has been, there is a kind of a majoritarianism that is there in Gujarat. Majoritarianism means two or three things, a few, a small section of the, of the majority community think that they own the land, think that they own all the resources, think that they own the government. And they posture themselves as basically as, you know, we are the people only and nobody else matters. I think this is serious. The Sachar committee report has very, very clearly said that say for the Muslims, you know, much more needs to be dis uh, done in terms of education, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of access to employment, in terms of their rights, in terms of their privileges. And there is a kind of a mainstreaming that has taken place in Gujarat, definitely in the last 11 years, but even before, to say that it's a real no-no. Today, if you're a Muslim, you cannot buy a house on the, in the western upmarket part of the city. You're not accepted easily. You cannot go to maybe the upward mobility, mobile areas. You're confined to Juapura or to the eastern side of the city. So that is clear, even to own a shop and so on. There are some very privileged Muslims, okay, who get what they want. But I mean, they are not representative of the wider community. The same thing is happening for Christians. This is apart from the Sachar Committee. You know, you're alienated, you're negated, and unless you kind of butter the government, you're not there in the scheme of things which the government is meant to run, even for minorities, to take care of every single citizen. That's the second factor. The third factor we also have to see is that there is both an official and there is a subtle oppression of the minorities in Gujarat. Like for example, where we Christians are concerned, we have the police coming and looking, wanting to look into our baptism register. And we are saying, who's the police to come and inspect our baptism register? In 2002, in the elections, Modi had promised to bring about an anti-conversion law. In 2003, he brought this anti-conversion law but took full five years to make the rules that are needed to govern the implementation of this law. And finally, what has happened? They have tried to put the law into practice with no results. We have challenged Girish Patel is our lawyer in the High Court. We have challenged and now we have asked that these things be expedited. We have challenged this law to say that it is unconstitutional. Now, if I am a Dalit and if I want to embrace Buddhism, I have a right to do so. But both this law states that if I want to change my religion, I first have to seek the permission of the civil authority, that is the collector. Now this is serious. Who is the collector to decide what religion I embrace? If I am an adult, I have a right to believe in this religion or that religion or even to stop believing in any religion. I don't need the permission of the collector to tell me what um, I should be believing in. And then there is another dimension of this law which says that anything that is forced, fraudulent, enticement, allurement, 
What is allurement? If someone tells a Dalit that you can embrace Buddhism, you'll get Nirvana, you'll get salvation. Is that allurement? A Dalit has a right for dignity, for dignified life. Yet this government feels that people who belong to the poorer sections of the society, the Dalits, the tribals, the women, etc., cannot think for themselves and cannot decide for themselves. And this is focused on minorities. I think this is serious. In a lot of the textbooks, there are a lot of biases about minorities. If you see the fifth standard textbook, you see the starting point of history in Gujarat, if it's Ithiyas, it has to be something which has empirical evidence. But you start the fifth standard social studies book with Katha, with Katha about Lavkush, about Sabri Mata, and they basically say that Sabri Mata is a good woman, an ideal woman, because she was cleaning the place where Lord Ram used to come. Now, this is serious. This is institutionalizing in the minds of children, you know, the need to support one particular religion, which is here the majority religion. At the same time, in a way, it denigrates the religions of the minority. There are many other examples that take place here where the minorities are concerned. And that is, it is very, very subtle, you know you have the labeling of minorities. Now this Kutike Bache, this puppy analogy, it's very, very serious. How can the chief minister make such an analogy and say that, you know, even if people are killed, what, what's the problem if I'm sitting in my car and my car ra runs over? I feel a little problem. You cannot compare a minority community, especially the Muslims, to puppy dogs. Then he spoke about the Burqa of secularism. While he was wanting to hammer the Congress party, no problem if he hammers the Congress party. Don't use a word which is sacred to a minority community, you know, like the word burqa. Then there is a whole dimension of trying to, uh, some time ago they had this Shabri Kum Mela, uh, you know, in the dance. And there were lots of posturing against the Christians, against the Christian missionaries. And everybody knows. That in 1998-99, the churches were attacked in the dungs, you know, people were beaten up. And till today, where the Christians are concerned, they, like the other minority communities, mainly the Muslims, are on the receiving end in this state. Yeah, first of all, the development model, which has been flaunted, I mean, all the social analysts say that it is all lies, it is a myth. Gujarat has always been a developed state. And his own party, men like Advani, has been very clearly saying that Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh has done much more work, his own party men. Okay? Economists, including Amritya Sen, the world's leading economist today in terms of development eco economists and inclusive, says that the model of Gujarat is, is not a model at all. You have had some roads. Uh, you have allowed the rich people to become richer. That is not a development model. In a democracy, the model of development is about inclusiveness. How does the whole society come up? And yet the whole society has not come up. Gujarat would have reached this stage of development with or without Modi, with or without the BJP, with or without the Congress. There is the Gujarati entrepreneurial spirit that has reached every corner of the world and you allow people. Now, let's say the nano land and everyone was talking about the nano land. They were supposed to make 1,500 cars daily and they are hardly making 50 cars here in the San and Plan. They are in a big loss. The land was taken from the people at a premium. There's a lot of problem. There is a lot of civil society protest about like this, this, um, this special industrial um, regions, the SIR or the SES, special economic zones. And the poor people are suffering. So the economic model that is being flaunted is not a model at all. In this scheme of things, I think it is very important for us to see what is happening to the minorities. Minorities have no place in the scheme at all. There is no inclusive development to say that you are an integral part. And if you are talking about development, development is not only economic. You have to speak about the holistic development of every single human being, every single citizen of a state of a country. You cannot avoid the, the social indicators like education, health, um, this, uh, the girl child, the status of women, 
clean drinking water, the sanitation. You know, Gujarat is feeling very, very poor in this. All other states have fed much better than Gujarat. And that model which is being flaunted, which is being saying that is an ideal model, it is a sure lie. It is a sure myth. It has been proved by top eco economists. And there is enough of data. And now if you are looking at this role of minority, as I said earlier, minorities not merely do not find a place, but they are excluded from this majoritarian uh, model, which helps the rich become richer, helps the Western interest, like his cronies, like the Adanis and so on, you know, become richer. They, are, they have a monopoly and it is institutionalizing corruption as nowhere else in India. You know, we have a highly institutionalized, uh, I mean, a state in which corruption has been institutionalized tremendously. The Gujarat government talks about appeasement, that in a democracy, in a secular country, we should not have, you know, um, they did not give it. There was a public interest litigation filed and the High Court said that the scholarship has to be given. The Gujarat government went to the Supreme Court, saying that it was anti-constitutional. The Supreme Court struck it down and said this is not anti-constitutional. The, uh, these children are deserving and every single government in the state must make provision to help the minority children. Now, about a month ago or something, after the, the Supreme Court ruling, they have finally come out with, you know, with a notification in the Gazette that some will be given. Whether the scholarship will actually reach the minority children and help them in their studies, in their career, in their future, we really do not know. My message to the people of India is this. Please remember, India is a great democracy. India is a country in which plural, pluralism, the diversity is its wealth. It's not about majoritarianism. It's not about who is a Hindu and one type of Hindu. No, we have to be a totally inclusive society. Hinduism is a great religion. The Hindus are great people. But so are, is Islam and so are the Muslims. So is Christianity and so are the Christians and the Jains and the Buddhists and the Sikhs and the Jews and the Parsis and all other religions and even people who don't have a religion. We are first Indian. Patriotism is about being Indian, not about being a Hindu nationalist or a Muslim nationalist. Patriotism is to follow what is written in the Bandaran, in the Sanvidan of our country and that is at, that is justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. The preamble is sacred to us. That is our Bible. That is our Quran. That is our Bhagavad Gita. We have to take an oath on that and ensure that India becomes an inclusive society. Our pluralism is, is kept and that we respect every single citizen, woman and man, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christian, Jew, Parsi, Buddhist, Jain, whatever the religion, because all of us, we say in Gujarati, Ame Badda Bharatiyo Che, Ame Badda To Bai Beno Che.